Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Oh Shoot. I'm your host, Cassidy Lynn, and we've got an advice column episode this week. These are some of my favorite episodes. I love reading your guys' submissions. Thank you to everyone that submits to this podcast. I swear this podcast would not exist without your guys' submissions. So thank you so much for writing in. It's much appreciated. And although I'm not going to be able to get to everyone's submissions, I just want to say thank you for submitting. I read all of them and it was really hard to pick like the few submissions that we're going to answer today. I say a few. I literally have like, (laughs) it feels like over 20. So I have a few updates and then we're going to get right into the episode because time is of the essence today. So, okay, first of all, it's Monday. You're listening to this. I'm hoping on the day that this episode comes out. So if it's Monday, I hope that this podcast episode just really gets you motivated for the week. You know how sometimes it's a Monday, but you really are just not feeling it. I hope that this episode gets you feeling it, okay? So if you're listening to this um, and it's a Monday, I want you to do like pause this episode and maybe put yourself in front of editing or pull up a gallery or something so that you can listen to me while you edit so that you really are getting motivated. Okay. Like, let's just, let me just be a little bit of like a bestie in your ear while you get something productive done. Okay. Sound good. Okay. So I have a few updates for you guys. Um, first update is kind of personal, kind of work related, but basically I'm going to Italy in October Okay, slay. I'm so excited. I'm going to Rome first. I also don't remember if I have told you guys about this. So if I have, just so sorry. We're going to Rome first for like three days. I've literally never been to Italy, period. Neither has Charlie. We're going to Rome and then we're going to Positano and then we're going to Capri. Okay. I have our hotels and stuff figured out for Positano and Capri. I haven't figured out Rome yet. And it's kind of stressing me out because I need to figure out how to get from Rome to Positano. We're like getting a car and stuff, but I need to know where I'm staying first. So if you guys have recommendations for like aesthetic, amazing hotels in Rome that are like walkable and all of that, let me know, like DM me or something. I, there are like thousands of hotels in Rome. I literally am just so overwhelmed I just want like a Lizzie McGuire experience. Okay. If you know, you know. So that's my first update. We're going at the very beginning of October, like October 5th or 6th or something like that. Next update. I have been doing these little TikTok vlogs and they've been kind of like get ready with me type of vlogs, but then I'll like put a voiceover over it and like say something And I've been really digging them. They're really fun to make. It's just different than my typical content. But yeah, I just kind of have been in this era of content creation and wanting to make more content and post more because I think it's really fun and it's something that inspires me a lot. So yeah, if you guys are over on my TikTok, you've seen these little like videos that I've been doing. Granted, at this point in time, I've only done two of them. I, I was supposed to do one today. I skipped it because it, it it's a lot of work, um, but I'm probably going to do one tomorrow for a wedding I'm shooting, like get ready with me for a wedding. Speaking of a wedding tomorrow, I don't know if you guys ever do this, but I booked a wedding two and a half hours away from me and we're not getting a hotel because Charlie has something at 7 a.m. the next day. So we're literally driving two and a half hours in the morning. We start at 1145. So two and a half hours, we have to leave at 915 at the latest. And then we get done at 945 at night. And then we have to drive two and a half hours home. So basically, it's going to be a over 15 hour day. Love that for me. But sometimes when you book things, you're like, oh, I'll be fine. I'll just drive the three hours. It doesn't matter. But then as it like approaches, you're like, why did I do that? That's kind of how I'm feeling right now. So I kind of just wish I would have gotten a hotel for tomorrow. But besides the point, I wanted to tell you guys three eras that I'm currently in. I am currently in, first of all, my content creation era. 
I just have been feeling like I want to create more content. Like I just told you guys, like I want to take more photos, take more videos, just like have more fun and just do whatever the heck I want. So that's kind of an era that I've been in. Going along with that, I've also kind of been in like my Pinterest era and like I've been feeling very inspired and searching for inspiration as well. Like I've been feeling inspired. I'm searching for inspiration. I almost want to create inspiration as well. So that's kind of how I've been feeling lately. Like I've really been on Pinterest and like this vibe of like creating fun aesthetic things for my stories. Like it's just fun. Like specifically my Instagram stories, I've been really like intentional trying to make my stories like this aesthetic type of vibe and like feeling a little bit more freedom posting like my Pinterest worthy stuff there. Another era that I've been in because it's busy season. I have been in my editing era. And what I mean by that is editing things literally like the day or two after they happen. So they're still fresh on my mind and I'm still feeling super motivated to get them done. That's kind of how I've been feeling. And I actually am completely caught up on my editing right now. I edited like two weddings and two sessions over the course of like last week, I think. And it feels really good to be caught up on my editing. So I kind of think I'm going to try to maintain this if I can. And I'm not actually delivering my stuff though that quick. So if I edit something Like if my wedding was on Saturday, I get it edited and done by Wednesday. I'm literally not delivering it for two to three weeks still because I don't want to like create unrealistic expectations. Plus, I do think that there's a certain magic and nostalgia from waiting to get your wedding photos and waiting to get like your session photos. I feel like if you get them right away, it kind of feels like, oh, I just experienced that. Like it's all still fresh. So it's kind of just like, eh. but if you wait a couple weeks and then you like get your memories back, I feel like it creates more nostalgia and it's almost more of like a memory rather than, oh, that just happened. You know what I mean? So that's kind of what I've been feeling lately with my editing. And that's it. Let's get into some of the advice for today's episode. Okay. We, like I said, we have a ton. So I'm going to try to answer these as concisely as I can. We have lots of topics, by the way. We have courses. We have people with cameras showing up at weddings. We have like mm, SEO and brand deals. Literally all of it. Okay. So I'm just giving you a little sneak peek. Okay. First submission. This person says, Advice on handling family members showing up to weddings with a camera. The last three weddings I have photographed, I have had a family member use their flash and take a picture and then hide it. I have it in my contract that I'm the only one hired. So frustrating. Okay. So I, this is like a a sticky boat to be in because yes, you have it in your contract that there can't be other photographers, But I do feel like sometimes, like even me, I carry around my little tiny digital camera wherever I go. Like I just like to be able to, you know, capture things because it's like my hobby and I like to capture moments, even if it's just for my personal memory. Um, So I kind of think family members with a camera is kind of equivalent to just family members having their iPhones out. Like everyone has their own way of capturing things. However... If it starts to get to the point where it's like they're standing in the aisle with their camera, they're getting in your shots. Like, I do think that you might be able to ask someone like specifically if it's a wedding and they're like in the aisle or like blocking you, you can say like, hey, would you mind moving or putting that down or something? I totally think that's okay. However, I kind of just have to I always try to think from the 
person that's getting married, their perspective. I, I really try to be super empathetic about situations like that, because if it is a family member, maybe it's someone they're super close to and someone that they care about. Most likely it is because they're invited to the wedding. So you want to tread very lightly. You don't want to go insulting people or making a bigger deal out of something that it needs to be. So my advice would be just kind of put up with it and like, yes, it's frustrating, but do your job as best as you can. If that person is obstructing your shot or making it almost impossible to do your job, making it harder to do your job, then maybe say something to the family member. I probably would never say something to the couple unless the couple noticed. So for example, I had a wedding um, a couple months ago where the couple was like standing in front and then they were like, kind of these steps behind them like it was like the altar but then there were steps and like a stage behind them and a family member was chilling on the steps in the back shooting towards the crowd on their camera and the bride like literally in the middle of the ceremony like gave me a look and like was giving people looks to try to get that guy to like come down and in that situation I would have said something like gone up to that person and said something however I think it literally was the bride like looked at this family member and kind of like motioned for him to get down and he did. But if he hadn't or if he hadn't seen the bride say something, I I probably would have said something. So it's an instant like that where I probably would say something. Okay, this next person says, what courses would you recommend to take as a brand new photographer? I'm a stay at home mom. I've always had a passion for photography and I love the business side of it so far, but it's really overwhelming. I have a website and a delivery service through Pixie Set and I want to take my business and online presence to the next level. I've had IG for two months and only have 100 followers. So I do think courses are great for beginner photographers. I would say be very careful which course you're choosing and make sure that you like the teaching style of the person that you're buying the course from. A lot of people will buy courses from people that maybe they've never heard of or they're not super familiar with. And then they don't love the outcome of the course or they just don't like the teaching style. It's not how they learn well. So make sure that you're kind of familiar with the person that you're getting a course from in the first place. I would recommend if you're brand new, you have a passion for photography but the business side is overwhelming. I would probably look into maybe getting a course that covers the business side of things, like the back end of things would be good for you. I mean, there's so much free content out there nowadays. I would try my best not to spend a ton of money. Maybe like get one course that you invest in and you're like, okay, I really think that this course is going to help me. And then do free education for like the rest of it. As far as like your online presence, so you want to take your business and online presence to the next level. I really do think that word of mouth helps your online presence a lot. So I wouldn't neglect that side of things. I would work on just giving great experiences to the people that you are taking photos of. And I do think that's going to help you grow your numbers. I was just thinking the other day, like about followers and, you know, there are people who want more followers. They're like, I want more followers. How do I get more followers? But it's like, that cannot be your mindset. Otherwise, your online presence is not going to be successful. If you're just looking for followers, you're probably going to get followers, but you're not going to create like a business out of it. It's going to be more just like you posted something that is clickbaity or whatever. So I think when it comes to building your online presence, you really want to be focused on not building followers, but more so building a community. Right now you have a community of a hundred followers on your page. I think that's really awesome. Even if you can grow a couple hundred more, great. Like you're just creating a community around your photography. And I think that's kind of the mindset that you need to have. And you can start by doing that just by word of mouth would be my recommendation. Um, Yeah. I hope they answered your question. I don't have specific courses that I would recommend other than my back to the basics course, I think is really good, but obviously that's my course. So I am a little biased. Um, but also that is not currently open for enrollment. So yeah, it's probably going to reopen in October sometime. 
Okay, this next submission says, I was hired by my boyfriend's cousin to photograph a wedding. I did their engagement photos, and the mom of the groom texted me four months after saying they didn't like them. For Texted me four months after saying that they didn't like them and wanted a reshoot. Okay. Because they were wedding clients, I did the reshoot. They said that they loved the reshoot photos. The couple books another session with me and doesn't like the photos. I get a voicemail from the mother of the groom firing me as their wedding photographer. I'm confused because the galleries were very consistent with my other work. I asked if they had any specific things they wanted and was told no. I feel at a loss because I feel like I did everything I could to keep them happy, and they still didn't like the photos. I ended up fired from their wedding, and to top it off, I turned down other inquiries that I had on their wedding date. Advice on how not to let this ruin me, because at this point, I'm reconsidering photography. Wow. Okay. So first of all, don't let this impact your overall feeling on being a photographer, because Everyone has like the one or two clients in their career where you learn a big lesson and it sucks. Like this situation definitely sucks. But I do want to say kind of think of this as a blessing because they were already hard to work with for engagement photos. Like imagine if you got to the wedding and like the wedding cannot be redone. That's a one-time thing. And they weren't happy with those photos. I honestly don't think this really has anything to do with your work. I think it's more so they hired someone that they didn't like their style, but like kind of looked over that and hired you anyway. I don't think it's anything you need to take personally because your style is not going to be for everyone. There's tons of different styles out there, tons of different ways to take photos. So I I wouldn't take that personally, but I do, I do think it's weird. Like the mother of the groom said that they didn't like the photos and the mother of the groom fired you. Very weird. So the one thing that you're going to learn from this, well, you're going to learn multiple things, but If you feel any sort of inclination while you're in the pre-booking process of like, oh, they might, you know, they might be a little bit of a problem client. They seem like they, they might give me issues when I deliver the photos or whatever it is. Even if the mother of the groom was kind of trying to hop in on like some of those initial emails or consultation calls and stuff, that's where I would start to kind of put a little note in my mind of, oh, this might be a little bit of a red flag. So this is just a good learning lesson from you. I just want you to know that not every single client is like this. And it sounds more like a them problem and not a you problem. I mean, if you were able to figure out what about the photos they didn't like, but if they weren't telling you reasons, then some people just are not the right clients for you. And that's okay. Uh, did you have to learn that the hard way? Yeah, but it's a lesson that you've learned. That sucks. Next submission. What do you do at a wedding if the event is running late? I find lately I have ended up staying over an hour late at a couple of weddings and don't think this is fair to my other couples okay and I don't think this is fair to my other couples or myself do you approach the couple asking if they want to pay for extra time I do have in my contract what hours are billed at so I have had events run late you have a couple of options obviously most of the time is out of your control Sometimes it's in your control, but most of the time it's out of your control, like especially at a reception. It's not your job to like make events happen. That's usually the DJ or a coordinator or whatever. Is it your job to kind of push along the timeline? Yes. If you're sitting at dinner and you're like, okay, we're, we were supposed to start speeches 10, 15 minutes ago, maybe go up to the DJ and be like, hey, when is this happening? Just want to check in. Sometimes situations like that are prevent preventable. Other times they're not like if for some reason the couple just is 
really bad at staying on track and like you're like hey we need to get you to the dance floor for dances and they spend 20 minutes getting over there that's not your fault now the next part of your question is like do you approach your couple asking if they want to pay for extra time I once had a DJ say to me never mention money to the couple on the day of like and this was at a higher end wedding the DJ because it was like the videographer was had to leave in like 10 minutes but we still had stuff and the DJ gave this girl advice because he was super experienced and he was like I never ask my couples about money on the wedding day I just stay and then invoice them after or figure it out after which I do think is wise like you don't want to go and ruin like a couple's feelings or like the magicalness of a wedding day because you're like I have to go But at the same time, you do have to know your boundaries and know I need to be paid for this extra time. So one approach could be, okay, I'm staying an hour extra because like dances haven't happened or speeches or whatever, and I'm going to bill them afterwards. For me, I feel like throughout wedding day, I have pretty good communication with my clients on what's next, like how we're doing on time, stuff like that. So I would feel pretty comfortable going up to my clients, not mentioning money, but I would be like, hey, just so you know, I'm supposed to leave in 10 minutes or 30 minutes. We haven't covered cake cutting yet. Do you want me to stay or are you okay if I don't cover that? I would probably word the question like that. If they have a coordinator or a maid of honor, maybe not a maid of honor, but like a coordinator, maybe go up to the coordinator and kind of ask them that question. So maybe you don't, you're not the person going to the couple, but the coordinator is. That's kind of how I would handle it. I would kind of feel it out per couple, just how comfortable you are with that that situation. Okay, next submission. I need help with a wedding package structure. I'm debating restructuring my wedding packages, but I can't decide. I'm currently offering a six, eight, and 10 hour package, but I'm thinking a six basic eight and luxurious eight and then a second shooter and extras also do you include second shooters in your packages or do you leave them as add-ons um this is a really good question i can tell you what i personally do and kind of what i've learned i've learned that most people book your middle package and my mindset has always been to structure my packaging so that that middle package is the most appealing. So I make my six hour package very basic to the point where it's like seems almost unrealistic to try to fit everything into that. It's literally just six hours, no engagement session, no second shoot or whatever. My middle package, all it's the middle of the road. So eight hours, most people can use eight hours and that's great. And like, that's good for them and I'll include either an engagement session or a second shooter so I kind of let people choose like pick your poison what do you value more most people do choose a second shooter and then I have my top 10 hour package which is like full includes second shooter and an engagement session 10 hours like more previews whatever Um, I will say some people do book my 10 hour as well. So that one, you know, does kind of get a little bit of a draw for more of the luxurious um, higher end weddings. Um, I think if you're going to do an eight hour and then an eight hour luxurious package, I might be careful with that. But I actually think it's kind of smart to do like maybe you can do a basic seven hour package and then like a luxurious eight hour I don't know because I I don't necessarily think 10 hours is 100% necessary all the time. I know a lot of people that offer nine hours, like they do five, seven and nine because like 10 hours is way too much. So that's kind of how I would feel, feel it out. You can do a lot of good market research just by seeing what people have booked before. If you don't have past clients to show for that, then maybe just like experiment and switch around your packages every once in a while, see what you book, see what you don't book. Um, And do I include second shooters or leave them as add-ons? I think it's kind of up to you. I do feel like a lot of the times in wedding photography, people like when everything's 
included all in one package because they have so much going on in the wedding planning process that it's a lot to then have to create a custom photography package and like add on or take things out. Like a lot of people just like the no stress. Here's a package. It has everything that I want. That's perfect. Um, And a lot of the times, like I said, the second shooter is usually chosen over an engagement session. So I might include a second shooter in like that all inclusive package. That would be my advice. This next submission is from Kaylee. Kaylee says, I just started photography this year and I'm loving it. I've been crushing couple fo- couples photo shoots and always love the results of every shoot, but I don't love my family work. I hate to turn away any client right now because all I want is to practice. I want all the practice that I can get, but I'm just not loving any other thing than couples. Any suggestions? Should I just focus on couples and ditch the rest even though I'd be losing clients? Personally, how I see it is all work is helpful for you at this point, whether that's you getting more experience or you getting money. You can do family sessions to help you save for a new lens. So if you do enough sessions, you buy a lens. Great. You don't have to post any of those photos or like showcase that you do them. If anything, you do a family session for someone and then they know someone that's a couple that wants photos. Like, I think creating those connections is the best thing you can do. Like I don't love the idea of turning away work when you're at a point where it's like, I just need work and experience and I need the money so that I can continue to reinvest it into my business. If you're at a point where you're like, I don't have time for anything at home. I am hitting my income that I want to with couples things. Um, then I would be like, okay, you're spending way too much time doing family shoots. That doesn't really help you. I would stop doing family shoots. But if you're not in that boat where it's like a time thing, if it's not a time thing for you, then I would say totally do it. That's, that's just kind of my opinion. Okay. This next one's from Susanna. Susanna says, hi, Cassidy brand deals for small photographers. Any advice on any advice for someone who has never done or pitched out for brand deals, maybe even free products in exchange for photos. Okay. So there are tons of brands that want just to send their product and get something in return and want to do gifted collabs. Tons of brands. A lot of the times smaller businesses or like businesses that are starting out or on the flip side, it's big businesses who are kind of cheaper and like don't really want to like invest in actually paying someone. So what would, okay. Advice for someone that's never done or pitched out brand deals. Um, I would say just like reach out to brands that you genuinely feel connected with or feel like would be a good fit for you, for your business. If you're just focusing on products, like that could be anyone, but like if you do portraits, maybe you could like reach out to clothing companies or jewelry stuff that like would already fit into the content that you're already creating when you are pitching yourself just like have a link to maybe um an example gallery or literally just have like if you have jewelry that you already own do like some example shoots of like what you're capable of whether that's setting up a white backdrop or doing like lifestyle photos get get those photos in your portfolio and then start to email people and be like this is what I could do like I would love to take photos for you in exchange for free products whatever um once you start to work with brands you know you might get people that start to reach out to you personally I've never reached out to a brand I've only had brands reach out to me so It's a little, I'm I'm sure it's trickier when it's like you're the one that's pitching yourself and like cold calling these brands. And I do want to say like, it's, it's hard to just like straight up email or DM someone and just shoot your shot. 19 times out of 20, you're going to get a no or like a ghost, but that one time is going to make it worth it. So just remember, you definitely are going to get ghosted for sure, but it's going to make it worth it for the people that do say yes. This next one is from Madison. Hi, Cassidy. My dream is to start a wedding slash couples photography business, 
but am a total beginner with cameras and honestly a little scared. I just moved to a new city, Auburn, Alabama, with my husband for him to go to grad school, so I don't have any family or friends to use as models. What do you recommend I do to try and find models so that I can get as much practice as possible? I love your podcast and your vibes so much. You're the best. Thank you. Um, I This is a tricky situation where you don't know anyone. Um, the best advice I could give you is to plug into your community, go to coffee shops, hang out, go do classes like yoga classes or whatever. Um, do like local stuff. Talk to business owners, shop owners. Um, Maybe there's fun little community events you can go to. Talk to your neighbors. I mean, at this point, you're really just, it's not a matter of, okay, yeah, you want to find models. If you really want to find models, you can pay an agency and build your portfolio. Okay. That's, that's how you can find models like right now. But if you really want to just like get that word of mouth going it's more a matter of like making friends, making connections. I, I, that's that's really it. I mean, there's even isn't there that app for isn't didn't Tinder create like a friends app or something or Bumble? It's like an app for like girls to find friends. Like literally you could do something like that just to like find friends and get connected. Um maybe you go to a hair salon, get your hair done and then be like, Oh, I'm a photographer. I'd love to take photos for you. Boom. There's a connection. You go get your nails done somewhere. Boom. There's a connection. Um, you know, you go to a coffee shop, you offer to take photos for them. You really have to put yourself out there in the beginning stages of establishing yourself in a business in a, in a business, in a new area as a business. I do know that there's, you know, in Auburn, there's colleges and stuff. Maybe you could plug into a college. There's so many different options. The answer really is to plug in to a new community. To find models, you you also can, like, go into Facebook groups. Um, I'm sure there's an Auburn Models Facebook group. Um, Connect with other photographers in the area. That's a super easy way, quick and easy way to be like, Hey, we have this in common. I'd love to meet up. I'd love to do a photo swap. And photographers are great models. Honestly, that might be my best answer for you is find a photographer because photographers, know models slash photographers are models. Like all the photographers I know are great models, honestly. (laughs) So I hope that helps. Um, and good luck on your move. Oh, it sounds like you already moved. I hope things are going well. This next one is from Sarah. Sarah says, okay, two things. Number one, when posting on clients, when posting clients on Pinterest, should you ask or have them fill out a contract? When I post on Insta, I always ask, but I've never asked about Pinterest, so I haven't posted any. Should I reach back out and ask or in the future have my clients fill out a release form or something? Okay, I'm going to stop right there and answer your question. Every single person you work with needs to fill out a model release. So start right now. Find a free model release on Google. Have every single person you take pictures of fill that out. It's 100% a legal thing. You have to do that. Um, Now, if you've already taken pictures of people, maybe just text them and ask if they're okay with you posting their pictures on Pinterest slash Instagram or just posting their pictures in general. Most people are going to say yes. Most people don't care. Email them, reach back out, whatever. Um, From now on, yes, have every single person fill out a model release. A model release allows you to use their photos anywhere on your website for paid ads all over social media. It lets you use your their photos however you want. Ultimately, you own the photos so you can use them however you want. But if the model goes and says, I don't want you posting that picture of me, then they have a right to do that unless they filled out a model release, releasing their rights to say that you can't post their stuff. Okay. Second thing I'm starting to pick up more weddings and I'm loving it. I wanted to ask how involved I should be. Should I be contacting the wedding planner and the priest beforehand? What does this look like? Thank you so much. You have literally helped me grow so much as a photographer and seriously, whenever I'm sad at my full-time job, I put on your podcast and immediately feel motivated. I'm hoping to go full-time in photography soon. Oh my gosh. I hope you go full-time soon. I'm so glad that this podcast motivates you. 
I've you've got a little bestie in me, okay? Anytime you need to you need a bestie, put me in your ears. I'll be here. Okay, so your question is about how involved you should be in the process. Um so I typically don't contact a planner or a priest beforehand unless I have a question. So if there's like a priest and I'm wondering like, okay, where can I stand in the ceremony? Like if it's at like, like a Catholic church or something, I might reach out to a priest, but typically I don't really reach out to anyone before a wedding. Typically and most likely a wedding planner should be reaching out to you. It, that's what I find is the most common thing is a planner will reach out to me, not the other way around. If they're a good planner, they'll reach out to you, send you the timeline, let you know what's up. Um, yeah. So that's kind of like how it works for me. I do offer my clients timeline planning. So that's like kind of my hand in the whole process. But I think it's up to you how it, involved or not involved you want to be. And it also depends on your clients as well. A lot of the times if your client has a wedding planner, like they have already chosen someone else to be involved in planning their day for them, which means you don't really need to be super involved in like the timeline and like all of that different stuff. They've got someone figured out for that. So you can kind of just gauge it based on like, okay, do they have a planner or whatever? This next one is from Shirley. Shirley says, I need advice on photo storage and backup system. Can you walk us through your process from the moment the photo shoot ends onward? Pretend you're talking to a 10 year old. Thank you. I can do that. Oh, show. So, okay. What are we talking about? Photo storage backup system. My system's not super crazy. I get home from, from a photo shoot. Well, at the photo shoot, I shoot on two SD cards. So, Automatically, we've got backups there. When I get home, I take one of the SD cards, plug it into my computer. I've got two hard drives. And on these two external hard drives, I back up the photos. So I take the photos from the SD card, back them up onto into folders on both my hard drives. And then I also keep those SD cards, set them aside. So I've got four backups. That's my backup system. Um, that's basically it. That's, I mean, I feel for me, four feels safe, feels good. Something happens to one of my hard drives. I've got it on the other. If something happens to both. I've got the SD card. So yeah, that's my entire process. I also do use Backblaze, which is like a cloud storage. And that just backs up my whole computer, which is a little bit different, but it, it works great. It's a good, good thing to have. This next submission says I need help creating my own presets. Do you just start with a blank slate and adjust it until you like it? Or is there another way of doing this? Would love to start selling my own presets. So the key to selling your own presets is making sure your preset is actually versatile and good to sell. So the process of creating your own presets takes quite a long time. And the reason being is because you have to use it on multiple lighting scenarios. You have to use it all the time and make tweaks to it. So I start with a base and I create a base based on how I want the end result to be. You know how as photographers, we can kind of visualize what we want to happen in our edit on a photo. Then you have to go and actually make that happen in the settings of the preset. And that's what's tricky. So you're going to start with a base. Um, you're going to want to do the tone curve, do the exposure settings. Don't mess with exposure or white balance, though. You're going to want to do HSL, calibration, color grading. Those are the main things you're going to mess with, which is a lot. You're going to get it, you know, just start with a base, maybe create a few bases. And then what I like to do is I create um, like a catalog in Lightroom of a bunch of lighting scenarios. And then I'll do create virtual copies of tons of these photos. So I'll create 10 copies of each photo. I mess around and create 10 bases. And then I go in and see like, okay, this base is the most versatile, um, but I like the coloring in this base. So I take the settings from one base and then I bring it over to the other one that has the most versatile exposure settings. And I am tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. It's a whole process. And I feel like you really do need to refine it over multiple weeks slash months until you really get a look that you like. So that's my best advice. That's how you start. Um, 
I do think like you, you have to start on a blank slate and just go from there. Um, everybody's process looks different, but for me, that's kind of how my process looks like. It's a series of a couple times a week. I'm going in and testing those presets and seeing what needs to change. I use it on my current work. Even if that's not what I end up delivering, I'll just like create virtual copies and just try editing the whole session or a whole wedding with just that one preset and see how it goes. Um, I did, before we go on to the next submission, I wanted to say I got a lot of submissions about education and like getting into education and stuff like that. And I just want to let you guys know I'm not answering any of those in today's advice column. I actually have some resources coming out soon for becoming an educator and stuff like that, passive income, whatnot. So stay tuned for that. Um, Yeah, for right now, we're just sticking with some of the basic questions. I I just want to tell you guys, know I saw a lot of your educational questions. And because I've been getting lots of questions about education, I've decided to start making a few resources for that in the future. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> this next submission asks, what does your schedule look like and how do you choose what to prioritize? I get bookings, but find that I'm shooting. I'm in an editing and shooting loop. I want to find time for passive income strategies and make actual business moves. Okay. If you don't have time to do anything, but shoot and edit, then you need to prioritize your time better, which it sounds like you already realize that that's not happening. So the most helpful thing that I did in my business was creating a weekly schedule for myself. And I will say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, here's what I'm doing on each of those days. Especially if you work another job, you really need to prioritize your time. Time is valuable. Time is more valuable than anything else because you can never get that back. So you need to figure out, okay, what's taking the most time? Is it editing? If so, can you figure out a way to minimize your editing time so that you have more time for other things? Are you using your editing time well? Are you kind of bopping around and not being as efficient as you can be? Sometimes... I, when people are like, oh, I spend too much time editing help. And it's like, you're going over the same photo 12 times and you're like, you're spending way too long on one photo. So if that's you, I would encourage you to not spend way too much time on one photo. Like don't overthink it, edit relatively fast and edit based on your gut reaction to photos. If you really feel like I'm a fast editor, I still don't have time then maybe you need to start outsourcing things because if you think of it big picture, if you outsource two wedding galleries a month or something like that, let's say it costs you $500 each, that's $1,000 in expenses, but you might be able to make $1,000 back per month or more than that by setting up a passive income strategy that's literally going to work for you. And like, it's not like you're going to be doing $1,000 in editing expenses every single month. It's just so you can get those strategies in place. Um, so that might be something you need to do. Um, yeah, but ultimately if you can do a Monday through Friday schedule and schedule time for you to start thinking passive income things, that would, that would be my best advice. You need, what's important to you, you will do, you know, it's just like when, (laughs) someone says like if he want if he wanted to he would like if he wanted to get you flowers he would get you flowers like what's important to you is gonna happen so make it important and make it happen okay like even if that means you have to cut into some of your free time which I'm sure you don't want to hear but sometimes you need to hear it this next question what is the best way to learn flash photography I have clients asking me to do bar slash elevator shots, but I've only always shot natural light. Thank you so much for everything you do. So the best way to learn is to do it, (laughs) literally. Um, Practice in different lighting scenarios. If it's like, oh, we're doing an engagement shoot at a bar, show up early, test your flash, or be like, hey, can I take a couple of test shots? The thing you need to know, your 
flash works best when your flash is fully charged. So make sure you always have extra batteries on you. Other thing to learn or know is that there, there's two main ways that I like to use my flash. One is bouncing it off the ceiling. Two is direct. Um, bouncing it is going to give you the most soft look. Um, and direct is going to be really bright, but it's obviously going to give you some cool results as well. Um, maybe even have your clients send over inspo of like what types of flash bar slash, what did you say? Elevator shots that they like. And then you could be like, oh, that looks like direct flash. or Oh, that looks like a bouncing flash. It, most likely if it's an elevator shot, that's going to be direct flash. It's super easy using a flash. I would recommend just starting on TTL mode, which is like the auto mode for your flash and then setting your camera settings accordingly. I have a full episode on flash photography somewhere in my podcast um, that breaks down like what your settings need to be and stuff like that. Um, but if you're feeling super self-conscious about it, try it, show up early, like take test shots, also do a mix of like flash and natural light. So you have the natural light photos to lean back on if your flash photos end up sucking. That's the best advice I can give you. And then you kind of like learn as you go. This next one is from, I think it's Camilla. It could be Camilla, but I think it's Camilla. Camilla says, I started selling photographs recently at markets. Everyone tells me how much they like them and how talented I am, but nobody buys them. I don't understand why. And I don't think it's a price problem. Okay. So the first thing I've never tried selling my photos at markets before, but the first thing, sorry, I'm readjusting. The first thing that pops into my head is I feel like people don't buy things unless they feel personally connected to it, specifically with like artwork like people buy art that they feel connected with and that they're, they just absolutely fall in love with. So it could be a matter of, they don't feel connected to it. If it's like there's people in it, then it's not them in it. That's why they don't feel connected to it. But if it's like a landscape shot or something else, like they just don't feel connected to it. Have you ever seen someone that like goes on this trip, let's say it's to Italy or something, and they like get engaged there or something big happens. It's like a great trip for them. Then they come home and I feel like people like start looking for things to bring back that feeling that they had in Italy. So they're they're looking for the ch- like the cafe chairs that they saw there. They're looking for um like a coffee table book that's like a in Italy recipes, if they really love the food or they're looking for a piece of art, a thing to hang on their wall. That's a photo of that place that they want because they feel connected to it. Right. So that's kind of the first thing that pops into my head. Maybe they're not connected to your art in the way that they need to be in order for it to sell them, sell like sell to them. Or Another thing is maybe the markets you're going to don't have the right people roaming around it. Like there's no art lovers that are willing to pay. There's no uh, people that are feeling connected to it. It's just not the right audience, right? Um, I do think that there are buyers out there, but just not at those markets. I think you might be better off selling prints and selling stuff online and focusing on like an Etsy shop or something a lot of people buy artwork and like photographs on Etsy. That might be your best bet. I mean, yeah, you're, you're probably going to make more money by selling things at markets. But like I said, if someone feels really connected to your photographs, they're going to buy them. Like, and I feel like in order to hit that audience, it most likely is not going to be in person unless you go to these extravagant art shows with like these super rich people all the time. Like you're going to find those really rich people on like a wider in a broader way, which is going to be the internet, you know, like the chances of someone like that being in a town at a market versus being on the internet, the internet's like the way more likely scenario. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of what I think. Not that I, like I said, not that I have experience selling at markets. So take that with a grain of salt. This next submission, I love this question. (laughs) 
And by love, I mean, <laughs> I don't. How do you not get overwhelmed and burnt out during busy season? I technically work three part-time jobs right now. Okay, that stresses me out, first of all. <laughs> I'm a part-time post office worker. I run my own photography business, and I'm an associate shooter for a local wedding photography company. I feel so overwhelmed. Sometimes I just want to quit everything and run away to the woods. <laughs> But the cost of living in Canada doesn't really allow me to quit any of those jobs to lessen my workload. So how does one manage to stay positive during busy wedding season? I'll take any advice, even if it's harsh. So how to not get burnt out? I mean, if you really need the money in all of those areas, I really feel like your business could replace being an associate shooter for someone. If you use the photos that you are getting from these associate weddings and then putting them, uh, putting that money towards your business, you could then make more money in your business because you're not probably profiting a ton from the associate thing, probably enough, but you're not getting paid as much as you were if they were your own weddings. So how to not get burnout? I would say maybe for next year, Try to book more of your own gigs so that you can lessen the associate load and kind of like start to create your own business from that. Um, that would be my advice personally. Okay, I wanted to say one last thing about staying positive during busy season. I think <laughs> truly sometimes I just give myself something to look forward to. Could be anything. Like right now I have a wedding countdown for how many weddings I have left that's kind of like a little something I'm looking forward to a little trip or literally anything. It could be anything. Maybe you're going to coffee with someone next week. Just give yourself a little bit of hope and like something in the future that you could be like, Oh, if I just get past this, then I get to do this. Honestly, that helps me a lot with staying positive. Also remember that you're hustling right now, but you're hustling so that in the future you don't have to. And I think that's a really, really important thing to remember because what you're doing now is helping you in the future. You're shooting these associate weddings so that you have connections and you're building your portfolio and building your bank up so then you can grow your own photography business in the future. So I think that's an important thing to remember as well to help stay positive with it all. Okay, next we have a submission from Emily. Also, I didn't realize we're literally at an hour basically already. All right, so I'm going to fly through these from Emily. Two parts. First, how do you decide what to wear to weddings? Colors, styles, everything. Um, okay, so to answer this one, I think about a couple things. Pockets, so like being able to have my phone with me. And I think of comfortability, what's the weather going to be like, what's the vibe of the wedding. Um, so for the phone thing, if I want to wear a dress and I can't have pockets, I have like this little purse sling that I just got where it's like a phone case that I put my phone in and then it like slings my phone across my body. So I'll use that so then I can wear a dress. If I do wear a dress, I try to decide, okay, what's the vibe? I want something that's a little bit more modest, probably not something skin tight, a little flowy. Um, I always wear shorts underneath, you know, stuff like that. If I know it's like a black tie wedding, I'll wear like a longer dress. And, um, you know, I've bought a couple longer dresses specifically for shooting. So that's something else to think about when you're choosing what to wear. I do like to wear black. If I'm not wearing black, I'm wearing like shades of brown and beige. Um, I just feel like that's kind of my vibe. I do have a couple of bright colored things like greens that I wear sometimes. So yeah, I think it's really just figuring out what the vibe is and getting like a couple of staple pieces that you really like to shoot in. So like a pair of trousers that you really like and feel like are really professional or comfy or whatever, a pair of shoes that you feel like really match that and kind of get the same color scheme or do like blacks and browns like I do and then just piece together outfits from there. Like I said, kind of based on the vibe of the wedding to like the venue and just kind of figure out that types of stuff, that type of stuff. Number two, what would you do if a guest at the wedding tapped you on the shoulder and told you that you were in their way and they came to support the couple? So now you need to move. 
This actually happened to me. There were plenty of empty seats ahead, including an entire empty row that they couldn't could have sat in, but they chose to sit in the back. Um, honestly, I would have been like, I'm sorry, I'm hired. I need to get my shot. Like, feel free to move over there. So sorry. Trying to get my shot. That's what I would say. As respectfully as I could. (laughs) Oh, that's horrible. Okay. This next submission, wedding photog essentials. I'm struggling so hard with what camera lenses and flashes are the absolute best. Oh, this just says camera lenses. I want to jump in with a bang, not with a whimper and okay photos. Yes, slay. I've done so much research, but now I have decision paralysis. Please help a girl out. LOL. Mm, This is very relatable. Um, I truly, I'll tell you my setup. It's the 85 millimeter, the 50 millimeter, and the 35 millimeter. 85 ceremonies, speeches, stuff like that. 50, I use for the ceremony as well, portraits a little bit. 35 is getting ready, um, portraits and dances. That's what I use. That's all I think I really need. I like the lower aperture. So if you find yourself using a lower aperture, you'll want to get prime lenses. If you're okay shooting at f2.8, maybe you get a 24 to 70 and then a 70 to 200. Those are the, the things you basically, when it boils down to it, boils down to it, you need a longer lens and a wide lens. So those two things are absolutely essential. Um, if you want to start with a bang, get prime lenses. Um, and then you said flashes. I Godox is my favorite bl- brand for flashes. I have the Godox V1. A lot of people use the Godox V1. They have it for Canon, Sony, Nikon, etc. There's also like an older version of the Godox V1. I think it's the Godox V860 is what it's called. So that would be another great option for you as well. Okay. This next submission is from Caroline and Caroline asks for the best products to have for content creation. Um, I personally think (laughs) you don't need a ton of products. If you really want to create content, you just need your phone. But if you want to get fancy with it, having like a phone tripod is really helpful. If I'm doing really any video, I have like this little phone tripod that I put my phone on. Um, you can also get a like little Bluetooth mic that plugs into your phone and then that you can like clip on your lapel or something if you're talking. And I do think having a ring light is pretty important. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm currently lighting my podcast with the ring light. Um, and that's just, I think it's good if you have like darker areas that you film or like you just don't have great bright areas where you live or if you can only film at night whatever having a ring light is essential so ring light phone tripod and maybe like a lapel mic Um, another not product but a tool would be CapCut or some editing software Um, is super helpful so that you can like just chop it all up and then export it for each platform as you see fit and like make adjustments as you see fit okay Let's, I think I have to skip some of these. Oh, I feel so bad. (laughs) I feel really bad. Okay. I'm just going to read some of the ones that kind of stand out to me because we're pressed for time. I would keep recording, but I have somewhere I have to go. Maybe I feel like I might need to continue this on another episode. No, I'm going to get through them. Okay. This one's from Sarah. Sarah says, I love your podcast. I like listening to the horror stories episodes to laugh and hype myself up on a way on my way to a shoot. How do I make my sessions a special experience for my clients? I want their sessions to be special memories that they can look back on and not just that one time they paid for a photo shoot. I like this question because it, it's showing that you actually are, you want to provide something valuable to your clients, which is important. And that's a really good thing to do. So I'm glad that you're thinking about this. Um, If you want it to be a special experience, the first thing that comes to my head is prompt and don't overpose. Take your time. Don't rush it. Don't make it feel like pose, 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 pose. Like put them in a pose, give them a prompt and kind of step back and let your clients and your couples 
just really experience it, like give them time to like walk and talk and um, prompt them to talk to each other and stuff like that. Um, Another fun thing is kind of adding an experience onto your photo shoot. So maybe it's like a champagne pop or a picnic or um, a pizza date or literally there's so many things, botanical gardens. You can go visit someplace cool, go on a hike, like that kind of adds to the experience of it because it's like, okay, yeah, we're hiking to the top of this mountain to get photos. But like the whole in between is like an experience of hiking up and, you know, all of that. Um, So that those are my little ideas for making your sessions more like an experience. Um, Okay. Hmm. Ooh, so many good ones. Okay. This person says tagging vendors slash interacting with them at weddings. Most of the weddings I've done have been backyard weddings. And now that I'm starting to work at more venues, I don't know how to act around vendors. (laughs) So vendors are really good connections. Some things that you can do. One, if you see a vendor, just go up, introduce yourself. Maybe ask them what their social media is. Give them a follow. Tag them if you're posting stuff to your stories, which you should be posting stuff to your stories at weddings. Tag them, take photos on your camera of their stuff, get their email and send the gallery to all of the vendors. Maybe when you go up to vendors on a wedding day, be like, hi, I'm the photographer. Can I get your Instagram and email? I'd love to send the photos to you afterwards. The amount of people that don't even do that, you are going above and beyond and you're already going to stand out to them. Plus the photos are going to be bomb. And then they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I loved this vendor. I'd love to refer them. So that's something that you can do specifically for the venue. Even if you don't find a venue coordinator or like the owner of the venue on the day of, you can still go out of your way and email them photos as well. I've even gone up to venue owners and been like, is there anything you want photos of? Like, you know, I'm here for 10 hours. I'm sure I'll have some free time. And the venue was like, oh yeah, we want photos of like this new fire pit we put in or, um, I don't know, different stuff like that they wanted pictures of. So I went out of my way and did that. Um, so really that's, that's the best thing you can do. Remember that vendors are people too, um, and treat them like that. If you're, if you just have a good attitude and you treat vendors like they're people and you're friendly and then you offer the photos for them and you tag them and stuff, I think that's the best that you can do, truly. Okay, I'm going to read one more, and then that's it. (laughs) I'm really struggling to figure out which one I should read. Okay, this one, let's do it. Last submission, here we go. I'm a beginner, and it's quite overwhelming with so much information out there. One thing I particularly struggle with, especially as a beginner, is pricing my work. I have no idea how to go about it. Out of curiosity, if you were to start your photography business from scratch again, what would be some key things that you would do differently? I love your platform. It's so incredibly helpful to have someone guide and inspire you. So thank you for all that you do. I'm so glad that you like my platform, like my content. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're a listener. Thank you for listening or being just a part of my little brand that I have going on. My little community. Okay. So if I were to start my photography business from scratch again, what would be some key things that I would do differently? (sighs) So this is a really good question. I think I would right away try to find my style as soon as possible. I definitely would use HoneyBook sooner and just invest in a CRM platform because I waited to do that. And that's something that really helped me honestly get more bookings because I had a system in place and automations and I was able to do things without doing them. So that was super helpful. Um, I honestly would attend more styled shoots. I only attended one in my first couple of years, but I really needed the portfolio. So I I wish I would have done more like that and like put together my own styled shoots. Um, what else would I have done differently? I think I would have focused on showing my face on my social media platforms sooner. I did a lot of just not doing that. Like I just wasn't really into that. I was kind of afraid. Um, Like I just didn't want to get judged, whatever. I wish I would have done it sooner because it helped my business so much. Just like being myself and 
putting my face out there and just showing me as a business owner and my likes and interests and hobbies, whatever, that helped my business grow so much. I wish I would have done that sooner, honestly. Um, I don't think I would have paid for the not for year two. Year one was helpful for me. Year two was not. <laughs> was not. <laughs> oh, I'm full of jokes today, aren't I? Hmm. Anything else I would do differently? I don't really think so. I, I, I'm a pretty firm believer that a lot of things that happen, you either learn a lesson or they help you. So it's like good to experience the things that you experience. But yeah, those would be the few things that I would do differently. Um, I wouldn't, there's a, a lot of things I wouldn't change. I think I learned a lot, had great lessons from just everything that I've been through. So yeah, cool guys. That's it for the episode today. I hope you loved it. I love these advice episodes. I feel like just hearing what you guys are going through. This is just like, these are some of my favorite episodes. Thank you for writing in. Um, I would love you. Okay. I would love if you could leave me a five-star review on Spotify. That would be amazing. And if you watch on YouTube, just leave me a little comment, a little heart emoji, maybe your favorite submission, your favorite piece of advice from the episode, whatever it is. I would love to hear your feedback on YouTube. Um, Okay, guys, that's it. That's all I have for you today. Thanks for listening. And I hope everyone listening has a great rest of their day.